This might seem heavy for those who are new to some of these things. You see the, the grand fulfillment of this whole culmination of this 70 weeks and 2300 days. It's just absolutely amazing. It, it is, and it, and it let, the truth stands for itself. And then you look around and say, well, who's teaching? Who understands this? And you'll find there's only one group. Take note of, of each of the position's views, take notes of the verses, each word, because every line upon line, and Revelation says those who remove one word or add one word, his name will be removed from the book of life. I absolutely love witnessing to my Jewish friends. I cherish uh, the, the quality of conversation because they're willing to engage in the dialogue, but they hide behind the mistranslation and misinterpretation concept so much that they use like Hebrew as this like barrier between the uh, Gentiles like myself mm -hmm. and Jews and being like, well, I, f I feel bad for you because even if we wanted to have a real dialogue, so you don't know Hebrew, you could never really understand the depth of the text. Welcome back to another episode of Truth Matters. I am Matthew Shanshe here with Mackenzie Drebbit once again. Good to see you, Mackenzie. Yes. Before we dive into all this, Mackenzie, would you start us off with a word of prayer? Yes. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that again we can uh, come together and we can share with the, your people and that we can study your word. We need your Holy Spirit because nothing is of any private interpretation, but only what you have written in your word. We don't want any of these things to be our own words, but only words that you would put into our mouths. So anoint our lips, uh, the ears of those who are hearing this word, that they would hear your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We are picking up where we left off for people who watched last week's episode. Please go back and watch it if you haven't, because this is part two of dealing with the 70 weeks errors. It's the end time error of the 70 weeks of Daniel 9, both acknowledging and looking at the end of Jewish probation as a nation, uh, as God's people, and understanding the evangelical errors for this time. Mackenzie, uh, thanks again for tackling this topic with us. This is such a critical and important topic for people now. Yeah. They don't realize even, and we haven't got to the punchline yet, mm. but when we're talking about all the things happening in Israel right now, in America right now, and just globally, and like we showed with some of the different presidents, some of the different uh, ministers, even people in government, whether it be Mike Pence or others who are in on a lot of this initiative, we need to understand this subject. Yeah. When we see something in the Bible put in such prominence, we really need to investigate because that means most likely the devil is having his workings and trying to deceive us in a certain way. Yeah. And this is a heavy topic. So I want to remind everyone, go to adtv.watch, make a login, and go to the resources part below the video, and then you'll be able to get the notes so you can rehearse these uh, later, look at them, study them for yourself. And look, we want to be doing this type of work till Jesus comes back, but we can't do it unless people support this work. We're 100% donations based. The Lord has provided so abundantly for us in, in the past and is continues to provide. But if people don't like get called to help us serve others in this, like we won't be able to continue. Uh, so what we want to ask is like, put whatever's in your heart, give as you feel compelled to give. But if you want to see more of this information, if you want us to keep going deeper and uncovering these errors and showing us how we can tackle them in a Christ-like manner, please consider supporting this cause. You can either call in, uh, we'll have links in the description uh, to go to our donation page. And, you know, we don't like plugging this, but it's just kind of a necessary th component of, of the type of nonprofit work that we do. And I want to encourage our, uh, our viewers and listeners, if you're seeing prophetic news uh, and you want us to be aware of it, we do our best to keep track of these things. But you can send news articles. If you think there's something important, we can work together and help us understand what's out there. Send anything that you think is prophetic or of note to PNP at AmazingDiscoveries.org. Again, that's PNP, Paul, Nancy, Paul, at AmazingDiscoveries.org. So we can kind of... Uh, crowdfund or crowd research yes. uh, because there's always things happening in the world, especially now at the rate that things are going. 
if it, I have people, some people send me things and I find it uh, valuable, even in the project 2025 stuff, somebody had to kind of tip me off to the importance of that. Cause I was on a research for other things. So brothers and sisters, we're all in this together. Don't be uh, afraid to uh, send us something. If you think it's important, we won't go down every conspiratorial rabbit hole. Right. Let's try to keep it to things that are, are pertinent to saving souls for Christ's cause, but that we are in this together in PNP at amazing discoveries.org for those who have something. And I want to add as well, we're always needing help in all of our different departments. Yeah. So if you have skills or you just have a willingness that you want to be involved in what we're doing here and believe in what we're doing, whether it's an editor, a designer, script writer, uh, marketing, product manager, marketing, advertising, I mean, a, a, any one of the uh, departments you can think of, then contact our client relations department yeah give them an email what's the best email that the people can inquire like so hr at amazing discoveries okay if you if you're interested in working for the lord and ad has impacted you and you're in video editing motion graphics any of the things that he just said we have a page on our website if you go there under jobs and then you'll see the different things we have them listed there sometimes they're not all listed maybe you have other skills that you think can can help and then there's a form that you can fill out there that will be sent directly to us excellent uh, that's how we we ended up here at some point so if you feel uh, compelled to uh, reach out uh, with your skill set and we'll do our best to try to see if there's a fit here for you um, all right. So last time we talked a little bit about, not a little bit, but quite a bit about Mike Johnson and his role with this extremist group in the Israel who has shown violent proclivities towards yeah. getting this temple rebuilt. And we saw that this new Argentinian president, Javier Mille, is also giving speeches about rebuilding this temple and quoting Talmudic prophecy, not Bible prophecy, but Talmudic prophecy. And we even saw that Javier Mille's last name isn't Mille, it's Milikowski, which is the same as the Netanyahu family, which was once also under the name Milikowski. And all this is just to show that there's a Zionist, a Christian and Jewish Zionist movement yeah. to rebuild and establish the third temple in Jerusalem. And we see that they have different reasons. But the article we looked at in the last episode says, even though they have different reasons for it, they're coming together with the same goal to usher in this building of the third temple. And what they hope happens is the coming of the Messiah or in the evangelical Christian perspective, the Antichrist, and they'll be raptured away before all this happens. And at some point, this is not a rapture-based conversation, but we'll uh, also address the rapture-based fallacy of everybody being raptured away before all the bad stuff happens. We wouldn't get a warning about those things if we weren't going to have to be part of it mm. or endure through it. So when we look at Revelation, it talks about that. And when it, we look at Daniel... But that's for another conversation. And, uh, you know, how uh, disheartening would it be for people who think they're going to be raptured away and then this stuff starts happening and they're still here? Yeah. Uh, there's going to there's gonna be a really difficult time. And so we want to try to break down these walls so people are not disappointed when these things don't happen the way they yes. expect or lose faith or end up on Satan's side because they think God has somehow turned their back on them or something, uh, turned his back on them. And that's not the case. We just need to be consistent in the truth. And we see that this Daniel chapter 9, 24 through 27 is impacting almost two billion people's world views of how things are going to go down at the end of time to the point where both Jewish and uh, uh, American politicians, or I said, should say Israeli and American politicians are actively pushing for this final third temple. Now we're going to start getting into the breakdown of 924 through 27. But as in the last one, before we do that, we got to lay some groundwork and people yeah. are probably like, just get on with it already. But we hope that the, the diligence in putting these pieces together gives a good foundation where people can actually believe what we're saying, not just taking our word for it. Before we get into that, we just want people to understand there is no private interpretation when we come to prophecy. Yeah. You can't have one person in a cave somewhere have the truth and nobody else has it. And there's a Bible verses to, to support that. Second Peter 1, 19 through 21. So if we read here from 19 to 21, it says, We have also a more sure word of prophecy. For unto ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation, 
For the prophecy came not in the old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. This is really important because one, there's uh, people there that don't think prophecy exists. It, it does, and it acts as a light shining in dark places, and it's going to mm -hmm. be known by a larger group of people, not uh, just interpretation uh, by and an individual. And we should take heed we unto have this to. light. Exactly. We have to take heed. And it also plays to the people who are prophesying today in these different uh, evangelical or charismatic or Pentecostal churches that uh, this is something that is very sacred. It's not the spirit of prophecy gift is not just tossed around lightly. It must speak according to the word of God. If it speaks not according to this word is why there's no light in exactly. there. Uh, so we need to be very careful because some, you know, charismatic is on there. Oh, I'm prophesying this. That's not how it works. Right. And we need to be very careful. We take this seriously because Jesus said some of the most gruesome things this one can do is blaspheme the Holy Spirit. And one of the ways to blaspheme the Holy Spirit is by uh, saying you're getting prophecy from God, yeah, granted through the Holy Spirit, and, and it not being true or speaking in uh, opposition to God's word. Well, that's where the other scriptures come into play where it says that if they speak contrary unto these words yes. and there is no light in them. When we're talking about this light that is shining in a dark place, they are from the dark place if they're speaking against the rest of God's word. Exactly. So they can't say, oh, the spirit came upon me. And I'm going to tell you that basically we need to change what the scripture says. Yep. That's not of God. It's not. And it doesn't matter how godly the person seems. Uh, yeah. there, I, there have been people I've asked who said, oh, is this person a, a real prophet? I said, is everything they say in accordance with the word of God? I say, well, maybe not everything, but does that mean that nothing they say is good? It doesn't mean that everything they say is a lie. That's not how Satan works. He'll fill you with truths, but then get the subtle error in the right place that is enough to just trickle down uh, and really cause issues later. There's, uh, a, there's a Southern saying, uh, even a blind pig gets an acorn once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite one is even a broken clock's right twice a day. There you go. So yes, you can have truth in there uh, and maybe even a lot of it. But if it's mixed with the wrong type of error, it could be very, very dangerous. And we want people to understand that the interpretation we're giving is not our private interpretation. So we're trying to make sure that anybody who's saying, oh, it's not that, or maybe even saying that it's not any of these four worldviews, yeah. but it's something that I found out myself and no one knows. I'm sorry, but it's not true. I don't care how clever it sounds. We uh, looked last time. These are the questions that I think anybody tackling this issue needs to ask. And can there be more questions? Absolutely. But these are the base questions that people should should be looking at in yeah. any discussion regardless of denomination when it comes down to the 70 weeks and we're going to start tackling these one by one in this episode first one is what is the 70 week prophecy about and as we looked at it's going to be based on the um these groups uh the protestant view really the evangelical view the catholic view judaism and adventist views are the ones that we're going to go through yeah. today so what's the prophecy about Let's actually read 24 through 27 uh, to make sure people are familiar with what we're talking about here. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon the holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring an everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandments to restore and to build Jerusalem unto, Messiah, unto the Messiah, the Prince, shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall, even in troublous times. We want to understand because we don't want to get too overwhelmed. We're just going to go kind of piece by piece and just say, OK, what is this? OK, four worldviews. Mm -hmm. What is this about? Yeah. And what you come up with is evangel uh, evangelicalism says it's the relation to the first and second Messiah advent and the Antichrist. So they're saying it's about when Jesus first appeared. It'll be about when he appears again, and it'll be about the rise of, of the Antichrist power. So that's what evangelicals will say this prophecy is about. Then in Catholicism, it says that it's specifically about the Messiah's first advent and that at the end of the 70 weeks that the gospel would go to the whole world. It would not just be about the Jews, but it'd be going to the Gentiles. In Judaism, 
you see that they say, no, it's not about any of that. It's about the destruction of the first and the second temples and the time period between these two events. And in Adventism, they say it's about the first advent of the Messiah. So it's not about the second one. And that it marks kind of actually like what the Catholic says, it marks the gospel going to the world. But unlike the Catholic view, it specifically shows that the Jewish era as God's people as a nation comes to an end because they didn't meet the probationary terms. So it's not just that the gospel goes to the whole world. It's that the time for the Jews as God's chosen people ends and the gospel goes to the entire world. That does not mean in any way, shape, or form that we're saying that Jews cannot be saved under the, the banner of Jesus Christ. It's just saying that as a nation that had been known as God's people collectively rather than just individuals, that time had had um, has ceased. Mm -hmm. And we're going to look at sources that confirm all of these views so you guys don't have to just take our word for it. And obviously this is regarding the 70 weeks specifically not the full 2300 days. Correct. That's a good good point because in the last episode we connected Daniel 8 and 9. Again, for people who are trying to walk into this and not seeing the last one, go watch the last one first. It'll make a lot more sense yeah. because we built a foundation and if you don't have those pieces, it's going to be hard to see that we connected Daniel 8 and Daniel 9 last time. We see that they're the same vision, that 9 is the finishing of the vision and that... Uh, these interpretations, none of them tell you that except for the Adventist one. Yeah. Yet if you just look at the Bible and how it's written, as we looked at last time, there's no way you can look at the vision in nine and not connect it to eight, yet almost none of these worldviews do. Yeah. So the Catholic view, the Messiah's advent and the gospel going to the world. The chapter which we read in Daniel concerning the 70 weeks contains many remarkable details. There's no doubt but what it constitutes a prediction of Christ's advent. For the gospel was preached by the apostles all over the world since they survived even into that late date. So it's clear that the 70 weeks from this view is about Christ and the gospel going to the world. What about the evangelical view? It says one of the most remarkable and important prophecies in the Bible is found in Daniel 9, 24 through 27. It is the cornerstone of messianic prophecy because it establishes the timing of both the first and second advents of the Messiah. Again, we're not saying this is true. We're just reading these as a perspective for yep. what the evangelicals believe. This, quote, prince who is to come is the Antichrist and, quote, the man of lawlessness who is the son of destruction. The same passage makes it clear that his covenant will enable the Jews to rebuild their temple. Mm -hmm. Okay, now we're getting a peek yeah. at what the evangelicals think about this. Now, the Judaism view. It says the angel Gabriel reveals to Daniel that, and this is the vision just in nine, because he doesn't connect it to eight in the article. And I suggest people take these links and go read the whole articles yourselves, because it's quite, if we want to get educated on these things, it's not just knowing the truth, but knowing why people believe these errors so we can help them see the errors. So it says, any attempt to apply this chapter to Jesus is erroneous and wrought in mistranslations and misinterpretations. Now, I find often, and this is with all due respect in the world, I absolutely love witnessing to my Jewish friends. I cherish uh, the, the quality of conversation because they're willing to engage in the dialogue. But they hide behind the mistranslation and misinterpretation concept so much that they use like Hebrew as this like barrier between the uh, Gentiles like myself mm -hmm. and Jews and being like, well, I, f I feel bad for you because even if we wanted to have a real dialogue, you don't know Hebrew. Yeah. Uh, and so you don't know Hebrew. You could never really understand the depth of the text. And to me, that's like really shallow on what God's intention is. God's intention is for people to understand. He's not trying to hide it behind uh, traditions or languages. If he really is a God of love and he wants everybody to have equal opportunity to know and, and love him, uh, this piece would not play any role in a God whose real goal is to do those things. And I want to make one extra point on this because the reality is even Christians, um, there's a sort of this idea that you have to understand Hebrew and Greek to understand the Bible. That's not true at all. And I want to just emphasize one part here because they're putting a huge emphasis on the Hebrew or the Greek or, or whatever, but this is not something crucial to biblical understanding. And what I mean by that, I want to give an example. And that example would be what we just seen in chapter eight in the last episode. So we see this this uh, he goat and the ram. And then Gabriel comes and says, oh, this is Medo-Persia, this is Grisha. 
But if you look at the Hebrew, the word goat just means goat. So if we're going by the he Hebraic word, it's goat. Yeah. And so this is why th that argument breaks down if you like take it to its full fruition. Mm -hmm. And we have to let the Bible interpret itself, not the Hebrew definition of the word, because that's irrelevant. Yeah. The relevancy is what the Bible is saying and how it's using the term. Yeah. So I just want to emphasize that because people get scared by, you know, maybe that statement even. Oh, you don't know the Hebrew. Yeah. Oh, that's true. Yeah. That but, must mean you're, you're less educated on the truth. But we, you and I both use a concordance, don't we? And so whenever we want to dive into the Hebrew and the Greek, we, we sure. do for the specific word. We can find where it's used throughout the scriptures, compare scripture with scripture and how it's used. And sure. the, the we actually don't need the Hebrew because fortunately today we have enough tools where I can see what the Hebrew says. I can see where it is and, and where it's connected. And I don't really need to know all of Hebrew in order to do that. And again, it's my interpretation or understanding of God's character that he's not trying to hide behind this veil or barrier for people. That's very... I mean, that's very... Oh, if like, you don't know the language, you don't know me. And it's no, very Islamic because Islam is also everything has to be done in Arabic. Yeah. You can't you can't read the Quran. It really, you can't pray unless it's in Arabic. So there's a whole bunch of Muslims like yeah. that when they started Muslim, they didn't speak Arabic. And you had to learn it. It becomes this huge wall yeah. between you and God. And that's not what God intended. It makes almost an elitist group. Yeah. It's oh, exclusive. I'm, I'm on this tier because yeah. I have this, you know, elite amount of knowledge. Yeah. But that's that's not what God is saying. It reminds me of the kind of the parable where Jesus is talking about washing the cup and they like wash the outside and they speak Arabic and they speak yes. Hebrew. But on the inside, it's just Filled disgustingly bones. dirty. Yeah. And, and gross and not worthy of being ingested for anything. Yeah. Because these the outward things, they don't bring holiness. They don't bring contrition of heart. They don't bring uh, a, a sinning soul to their savior in and of themselves. Yeah. And so it doesn't it doesn't matter the Hebrew. But with this, we see that this third view is fundamentally different than the first two. Yes. And it makes sense because the Jews rejected Jesus. So they have to fit all of this within the tenets of their own worldview. And here we come to the destruction of the first and second temple and don't apply any of this to Jesus. In fact, they put like something called a rabbinic curse on anybody who tries to calculate this. And I know there is going to be some Jewish person who reads this and be like, they don't understand what they're talking about. When you look this up in the Talmud, it's actually re uh, referencing Habakkuk 2.3. But when you read the footnotes, footnote 19 in the Talmud, it's talking talking specifically about the advent of the Messiah. It says in the footnotes. So what it tells me is the Habakkuk vision in 2.3, the one where it says, for the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie, is connected. They know that it's connected back to the vision of Daniel 8 and the finishing vision of Daniel 9 in some way. Yeah. Because that rabbinic curse is specifically talking about the timing of the Messiah and the only one that's a specific from the timing Messiah is, is this one. So they're basically saying, don't look Look at the vision don't calculate yeah. the time and they say that the justification is because if you calculate it and it doesn't come you'll think he'll never come at all yeah. so don't even bother putting time on it but people will say well that's a that's not really a curse but it is because if you do the calculations correctly you will realize that the messiah did come at exactly the appointed time and what it meant was the end of the jewish economy and sacrificial system and chosen place with God. So it's not just as casual because I've seen people debunk this as not being a big deal, but it is because it's telling you to reject what God has laid out as a clear sign of what his, his son's uh, coming was or the Messiah's coming was. Now there's so much that we could say regarding this and regarding, um, all the prophecies and the vision in general, because that even that term, the vision is so packed in mm -hmm. Daniel and the term, the vision here is incredibly packed. Mm -hmm. um, and if the, the Jewish people actually compared the Hebraic wording from Daniel eight and in he, uh, Habakkuk two, two and three, then they would see a big correlation there. Like they're writing, but they're not making the connection. Yep. So, or they have, and they refused to acknowledge it because that, of the implications. Too. Because I mean, it really, uh, the, the rabbi that I spoke to when he asked me, okay, Matt, he was quite, quite interested in the perspectives that I shared. He said, it's quite different than any of the other Christians that he'd heard before. He said, what happens to the Jewish nation at, at the end then? What are you saying happens? 
And what it, the, the hard part is the truth, accepting it sometimes means a total shift away from everything that you ever thought was the truth. Mm-hmm. And that comes with such a price that many will stop their ears yeah. and just not listen anymore because it would mean turning away from what they were raised in, what their parents believed, what their grandparents were about, what Maybe their culture what they and community. Maybe what they preached for so long. They could have been like Paul or Saul, yeah. like preaching for this long that they like... This Actually, is, that's like one of the ultimate humil- humility stories is Paul going from one extreme to the, well, it wasn't the other extreme. It was just the right side now. Yeah, yeah which was still ex- extreme in the face of what he was doing. Yes. Kill the Christians, then become one of the most powerful advocates for Christianity. Yeah. That is, is certainly something to witness. And so when I told him that, that the Jewish people have the same opportunity to be as special as they ever were, ever, just as Noah and Abraham and all of these guys were a faith covenant, that has not changed. The probation for the nation has changed, but your opportunity to be a child of God, which is the highest Mm -hmm. obtainment anyone could ever hope for, is still intact. And he's like, yeah, but can't you also do that? And I said, yes, through the same faith covenant. And he was sad that we could share in the same thing and have the same role and that there wasn't a special. And I'm not saying maybe for faithful Jews of the house of Israel, maybe there is something, but it doesn't matter is the point. The point is that we are together brothers in Christ, that we can have this faith covenant, which Christ was a Jew. The apostles were Jews. Paul was a Jew. Like these were all Jews. We get to share in this together. And he saw that as a bad thing. Yeah. Uh, And that was really sad for me. To, to hear that because it, it was like unless there was some special place for uh, for Israel and, and Jews as a nation, he didn't want anything else, which is really tells me he doesn't understand the gift that's being offered. And, you know, I think that sad. comes with um, a lack of appreciation for what you have, you know, and what you're being given, because we don't understand the severity of even this prophecy we're talking about. And I want to steer this back to here mm-hmm. because what we're saying is applying to this. For instance, when I was younger, I was very involved with like music stuff and playing instruments. And then I was learning, you know, um, in heaven will be, each one will be given a harp and able Mm -hmm. to play. And and I was angry at that because I was like, I'm working so hard here to be so good. And then (laughs) someone else is going to come and they're going to be good right off the get go. I'm like, no, I should at least be, you know, double as good as someone who didn't practice at all. Yeah. But you have to, you know, those who are forgiven much, forgive much and love much. Amen. So when you feel that you're special because you're special and then someone else who you don't view as special is just as special. Yeah. It's almost a letdown. Yeah. Right. And that's where the humility comes in. We have to let go of the 10th hour worker, the 11th hour worker. That was the parable I was just going to say. Are we going to be the guys working and laboring in the field and then getting upset that guys get the same wages? We should feel privileged that we got to work in that field for as long as we did. Yeah. And that there should be no animosity that they get the same wage because it wasn't the time we got to put in. That's a reward. We get yeah. like, it's a privilege to be able to get to do that work. And so like, to me, that parable really stood out with the laborers in the field when, yeah. when having this dialogue, just because it's like, you know, you shouldn't be looking at it as like, I don't want him to have that. We should be joyous that we all get to partake in it. You know, it's almost like this. Those people who are complaining about the others really are going to be the same ones who go to Jesus and say, I prophesied in your name. I did all this Mm. in your name. And Jesus says, I didn't know you. Because if you are doing this through a pride thing, you really don't know Jesus. And you were only doing this because it benefited you. And this prophecy here removes all of us from that because this is regarding truth and it's regarding the factual delineation of events that are taking place over this time frame and right now the 70 weeks. And it takes, this is all about, it is all about Christ mm-hmm. in the end. And we're going to see that very clearly. From Genesis to Revelation, Old Testament to New Testament, uh, you know, Breaker that we'd looked at a few weeks ago, Breaker says they're different. It's all in Christ from beginning to end. Ever all so- prophecy is about Christ and is Christ. And Christ is prophecy and prophesied. Every action he did here was a fulfillment of a prophecy. Yeah. 
Since Everything he did. And so often through the Gospels, it says he did this to fulfill the prophecy of whoever it was, exactly. Isaiah or, yeah. you know, any of the other prophets. And no different is that here in Daniel chapter 8 and 9. Nope. So let's keep going. And I want to just say that the, this is given from the Babylonian Talmud. And uh, the rabbi I, I uh, spoke with and witnessed to occasionally, he is a, a student of the Talmud, like hardcore Talmudic law kind of guy. And uh, what I find interesting is like <clears throat> you and I would say that the highest citation is a thus saith the Lord. Mm -hmm. Right. And the, and the Protestants felt that way. And the apostles felt that way. And the prophets uh, felt that way. Like thus saith the Lord is the highest. But I want us to take a peek into what the sources look like inside of the Talmud and see if it's different. And this is just a glimpse. It says, but doesn't Hezekiah say that Rabbi Yeremiah says in the name of Rabbi Shimon bar Yohani? Is that a thus saith the Lord? Where's the Lord in in this citation? It's totally gone. Mm -hmm. It's going, this guy Hezekiah, based on what Yemiah says, on another what this guy says, and that's the entirety of the Talmud. You get language like this. Rabbi said this, and he's commenting on the comments of this rabbi who was commenting on the comments of the comments from this rabbi. Yeah. And it turns in the Talmud isn't God's doctrine. It's Babylonian doctrine. There's a reason it's called the Babylonian Talmud. And it's, it's terrible. It's horrific. There's nothing in there uh, that is godly, in, in my opinion. And I've looked through it, and I've had to ask <clears throat> a couple of Jewish people, why does it say this about children here and about this thing here? And they're, and they're like, oh, you're misreading it. But it is littered throughout. I have yet to get good explanations of, of why it's okay to do certain things to children of certain ages uh, and see how that's of God. And there's a whole host of things in there, and I've never been able to get a straight answer. And the Bible t warns us of such. It says, but in vain they do worship me, teaching for commandments, uh, for teaching for doctrine, the commandments of men. So all this rabbi citing rabbi citing rabbi, it's just them. And then the prophecies coming out of the Talmud, it's just commandments of men it's doctrine of men first corinthians 3 19 says for the wisdom of this world is foolishness with god for it is written he taketh the wise in their own craftiness yeah. and most of the jewish world especially those who consider themselves like scriptural doctrinal basis focus on the talmud and not the torah or the tanakh which is the whole of the old testament major and minor prophets included. So uh, I just wanted to share that with people uh, to maybe who haven't peeked inside of what the Talmud and they hear that word Talmud and don't know what that means, but it's rabbi upon rabbi upon rabbi upon rabbi and no, thus saith the Lord, even though they do commentary on specific verses like this. So now we're going to get to the last viewpoint and obviously the one that we believe is true and under the weight of evidence, we believe it has the strongest case for it. Does that mean, and this is also something I want to get clear. We don't say that every worldview has no good points, but just like you can't win a tennis match with one point, you have to win game, set, and match in order to win the, 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 the whole thing. And here, that's kind of how we approach these things. Just because one side has one good point or two, you can allow those to stand and not feel like that has to be invalidated as much as you can say, okay, there's your one point. But what is the body of evidence? What's the weight show over time? And I believe that just like we saw in the last one, connecting eight and nine, the weight of evidence or that Daniel's written in the sixth century, the weight of evidence will show that one view is, is more valid than the others. Yeah. So the meaning of the prophecy, the first Savior's first advent and the end of the Jewish nation as God's chosen. And here's the quotes for that. The time of the first advent and some of the chief events clustering about the Savior's life work was made known by the angel Gabriel to Daniel. Seventy weeks, said the angel, are determined upon thy people. At the termination of this period, the Jews have ceased to be God's chosen people. The gospel would be preached to the Gentiles. Okay, so as we're reading this, I just want to reiterate, we are not... Uh, saying anything against the Jewish people. We are just expounding what we believe the scriptures say. This is not indicting or or saying, judging the, the Jewish people in any way. As we said, the, the door is still open for them. But the, what we believe and what the, the uh, books that we have on this topic share is that this probationary period ended. And as we see, the conditions in verse 24 and 25 had to be met. And if they weren't something, there was a consequence for, for not meeting There's these. no longer a nation governed directly by God like it, it was in 
the Old Testament. And this is why Zionism became so prevalent because uh, they wanted to set up the political state and where Ju the Jewish nation was God's chosen people. They didn't actually really have like a necessarily a set territory. They were moved around quite a bit. And after that kind of the 70 weeks really, and there was a dissipation of the people and the sacrifices ceased and all this stuff, which we're going to dive into more, uh, you, you saw that the, the nation itself just kind of, crumbled away and the Zionists needed to bring it back together. But in this case, it wouldn't be based on God's covenant or, you know, the, the history of the Jewish people. It yeah. was based on a politically motivated charge to set up what looked like a state that represented God's people. But like God's intention was never to set up a political state. That is a very Zionist, non-biblical thing to do. And that's why in the gospels, when we see about Jesus, even some of the disciples, they misunderstood and he didn't come to set up this kingdom, kingdom again, earthly kingdom, and which is why they're upset. You know, it's funny, I, I, in asking the Jewish rabbi, like, uh, what was needed for this, like, rebuilding of the temple? And he basically said, like, that the, the Messiah needed to come and reestablish all of these things and that they were looking for, I said, what is this Messiah going to do? What are you waiting for? He said, he's going to set up Israel as God's nation. And he's like, don't worry. That doesn't mean that you can't be included. You won't be us, but you could, you can be included in this. Like there is going to be a war against the, the, the Goyim, he said, but like we expect this Messiah to come set us up in our proper place here on earth. And I'm like, you know, you just, I feel bad. You're just going to be disappointed. This is the exact same thing the Jews of old thought. Or they won't be disappointed, but it'll be a grand deception. Well, that's a good point. And yeah. that's, they may the, have their that's the reason that we're talking about this. Yeah. Because number one, either people will be just disappointed or they will be involved in something much more sinister. Which is actually more likely than being disappointed at this stage. At, at this <laughs> stage, it's it's going to be the, the sinister culmination Deception. of things. Yeah, yeah. And so I think hopefully like the four views, they're, they're starting to be clear. Three of the four say it's about Messiah. It's about something related to the advent. And then the Jewish one says, no way. We put a curse on anybody who says otherwise. And Jesus said... This gospel, this kingdom needs to be preached to all the world. But if we're looking at it strictly from like a Jewish perspective, it's only for the Jews. Mm -hmm. You know, there's not this um, getting the message to everybody, right? Because mm -hmm. you have to be in the bloodline or that that's really all that can be done. That's interesting you say bloodline because that's another aspect of the conversation I have with the rabbi, which is, you know, it's in his view, it's by blood. Like being a Jew, it doesn't matter if you follow the faith of Abraham. I actually have a secular Jewish friend that like I witness to all the time about this. And he's the one that got me in touch with the rabbi, oddly enough, because he thought if somebody, you know, smarter than me, who the rabbi, I'm sure he is, could come and school me on these things and, and you know, maybe the opposite happened a bit yeah. and that you, you, you pushed him a little bit, but he, the, my secular Jewish friend says, no, I'm still Jewish, but I reject that there may not be a God in heaven. Uh, there's, you know, there's, I don't keep any kind of Jewish faith, but I'm Jewish because I was born Jewish. And if I'm born Jewish, I'm, whether I choose to participate in the faith or not, I'm still better off than all the, all the goyim yeah. that are, are floating around, even though I reject everything about it. So somehow along the lines, and this is, was, again, the problem of the ancient Jews, because if it's like if you were the children of Abraham, you'd have done the works of Abraham. Yeah. You know, he spoke of me like you're, you're reading the scriptures and these are they that which testify of me and mm -hmm. you don't understand these things. So it's like the same stuff happening then, even though we're modern and all this information this same mindset is permeating in the Jewish world today. There's nothing new under the sun. It's it's incredible to me. And they say he's going to come back, not only build this temple, but he's going to make war against the heathen. And the, the rabbi shared with me that this is the view. And he's like, well, you know, they don't, you won't necessarily be part of the heathen, but like you got to acknowledge the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Like, so this Messiah is coming back and going to set up this nation and make war with the, with the heathen. And this is what the Jewish nation wants. And if you tell them that they're not, that's not going to happen, but they can still be a child of God. Most of them will be very sad or angry with you. So we see the four views stacked up next to each other and they're similar, but they're also very different. And this can lead to a lot. When you look at the end result of all these, they all end in different yeah. places and it's that's why understanding these things is so important so next question 
what are the 70 weeks? And what we find is that all four groups look as this 70 weeks and they identify it as something important. So they're all four looking and saying, yes, this is something we can understand and yep. we are going to give you our interpretation on this understanding. So none of the groups say it's unknowable and not important. The first part of Daniel 1, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and thy holy city. We've seen this a few times now. And I asked the rabbi, what is, who is thy people and who is thy holy city? And he said, that's the Jews and the, the holy city is Jerusalem. And I said, absolutely correct. That is how mm -hmm. I read it as well. So we have 70 weeks, we have a time period and we have, it's for the Jewish people and it's for Jerusalem. Yeah. So we don't have any questions about that. Now let's see what Judaism says. Daniel chapter nine uses the Hebrew word Shavuim to represent a period of time multiplied by seven. For various reasons, this word translates as weeks and means a multiple of seven years rather than a multiple of seven days. The angel Gabriel in verse 21 revealed to him an expanded prophecy of 70 weeks, 490 years. So the Jews say the 70 weeks equals what? 490 years. 490 literal years. What about the evangelicals? In this passage, key passage from Daniel, the context makes it clear that he is speaking of years, 77 of years, which would be a total of 490 years. It is therefore appropriate to refer to the prophecy as the 70 weeks of years. So evangelicals say, how many years is it? 490 years. 490 years. years. The Catholic uh, source says you come out to 70 weeks of years. That is a total of 490 years. The Adventists, a day in prophecy stands for a year. See Numbers 14.34 and Ezekiel 4.6. The 70 weeks or 490 days represents 490 years. All the groups agreed that the 70 weeks is 490 years. This is almost miraculous mm -hmm. <laughs> because if you go ask uh, a Jew or a Catholic or most Protestants, do you use the day year principle in prophetic interpretation? They're going to be like, what? What is that? What are you talking about? And in fact, you go to all these other prophecies where day year principle is included and they're like, that doesn't work. That doesn't work. But on, for some reason on this one prophecy, And then prophecy, they take all they the other it. prophecies and they throw it literal wherever. Yes. And so why do you apply, universally apply day year principle here, but reject, reject the principle elsewhere? The, at Very least the Adventists are consistent in applying day year principle consistently. Yeah. I found that really, really interesting. And here, Rabbi Ben Sion Kravitz agreeing, saying both Jews and Christians agree that this is referring to a multiple of years for 490 years. One phenomenon that might be contingent on that is because 490 days didn't wasn't a long enough time period so they had to do something about that which was to conclude that well in this place is probably 490 years that's right because when you read the total context it says this is not going to be for a long time it's going to be for the end of time and like obviously 490 days is not that long that's just like yeah not long year at all. a year and a, half. and a half maybe so uh anybody who studied this knows that that couldn't ha have applied correctly they just didn't continue and realize that if it applies here like that why wouldn't it apply like that in other places so we see unequivocally that all views translate this verse as 490 years for israel and jerusalem that's all we know so far, but like anybody saying otherwise, they're back to that verse where we says there can be no private interpretation. Yep. And Twitter is filled with people with their own private interpretations that don't even understand the basic tenets. So brothers and sisters, be careful where you're getting your information from because people can make up a lot of stories that sound really good, especially with the Trump narrative right now and the messianic aspect of going yep. on. But the Bible interprets itself and history can show that we can bring out most of the answers and we don't have to be geniuses like we're not matt and mckenzie aren't coming up with this ourselves we're using what's readily available that anyone can use to, to yeah. come to these understandings so we now know for sure what the 70 weeks are what are the conditions that we see this is where things get really interesting this is daniel 9 24 part 2. so he said 490 years for jerusalem and israelites to do what what are the conditions one to finish the transgression Two, and it just reads exactly like mm -hmm. a probationary sheet. Like you don't have to go far to make that stretch. Two, make an end of sins. Three, make reconciliation for iniquity. Four, bring in everlasting righteousness. Five, seal up the vision and the prophecy. And six, to anoint the most holy. And back to Rabbi Ben Sion Kravitz, this prophecy also included a description of events that would unfold if the Jewish people did what? not repent did not repent properly mm -hmm. the properly is important because like in Abel and Cain like what if they did their own version of repenting 
No, it's not just repentance as you see fit. It's yeah. by design as God prescribed it. Just I like going back all the way to Abel and Cain. And I think we can all agree on that point. Yes. And it's amazing to me that the, the Jewish people can uh, admit that this is in relation to them and what does not, what happens if they don't repent properly. But then what happens is they start con misconstruing uh, the details after this when it didn't happen. So let's now kind of break this down per uh, condition based on the various sources. Remember, we're going Judaism, Catholicism, Evangelical, and Adventist. And we're going to bring each point out for the different uh, parts and show what each group thinks they mean. And we sometimes lump them together. So this is directly from the Jews for Judaism article. He combines the first three together. He says one, two, and three is to atone for their past transgressions. But he doesn't say, what does that mean? How do you atone for past transgressions? Mm -hmm. What's included in all that? So he's kind of lumped the first three together and made it a very like watered down version of what's actually going on there. And to number number four, he says, is about the temple service. So bring in everlasting righteousness. This is telling us that the Jews are saying that the way to bring in righteousness is to reinstitute the temple service. Can the temple service bring righteousness in and of itself? No. Of course it can't. There's no way, just like slitting the throats of goats and rams can't remove sin from the person. Only the blood of Christ could. Same with this everlasting righteousness. The temple service couldn't bring in righteousness in the past, and it can't bring in righteousness now because it's not our righteousness that can be put up before God. It has yeah. to be Jesus's. Number five, seal up the vision and prophecy, fulfill the promises of the prophets and end the prophetic era. So he's saying after this is done, there will be no more prophecy ever. And the, the Jewish view is that by fulfilling all this, the end of the prophetic era is over. Well, was there more prophecy after the 70 weeks finishes in the Bible? Well, if you understand it correctly, there is. There's a lot. There's a lot. Uh, exactly, but you have to understand it correctly. <laughs> and six, to anoint the holy of holies. And to them, again, this is in relation to the temple. I think they watered this down quite a bit to make it fit because I don't see any place in the Old Testament, and I'm, I'm open for viewers and, and commenters to share breakdowns. How do you bring in everlasting righteousness by instituting a temple service? Using Bible verses alone. I would be very curious to see how, how that adds up. And then to anoint the holy of holies. Now, well, if if the temple service was to bring everlasting righteousness, why didn't it do that for the children of Israel who broke it, which got them into this predicament in the first place? Twice. Obviously, it's not bringing everlasting righteousness because we're dealing with fallible people. Correct. And they're rejecting the way that one can have righteousness, which is through the blood of the lamb. And then that makes it very difficult to bring in everlasting righteousness. Okay. How do evangelicals read part two of Daniel 24? It lumps one and two together. It says that one and two are a rejection of God and a daily life of sin. So they're saying that the transgression is they've rejected God's and, and God and that they live every day in sin. And I think that's, that's partially true. Uh, three, to make a reconciliation for iniquity. That means to accept Jesus's blood on the cross. Uh, I'm not going to say whether we agree with each one yet. Let's just keep going through. Uh, to number four, it says to bring an everlasting righteousness is introduce Messiah's reign on earth. Uh, number five, it says is the fulfillment of all prophecies concerning the Messiah. So it's saying rather than it being the end of the prophetic era, that this would be all the messianic prophecies wrapped up. And I, I would probably slightly disagree with that because I think there was more after this is done. But um, again, we won't, we won't get into that right now. And then six, to anoint the Holy of Holies. Again, this is to anoint Jesus at the second coming or at uh, the Millennium Temple. So they don't know whether this is the second coming or the temple that's built during the millennium here on earth, because in the evangelical view, it's different from the Adventist view in this, that the millennium takes place here on earth. And we teach that that's one of the biggest deceptions that Satan's coming to, right. to do is when he shows up and dead people come back to life. And if you haven't watched those, go watch our America in Prophecy series. Yeah. It wasn't titled that, but it's something like uh, that. But we go into like one of the main deceptions is that the millennium takes place here on earth and that the Jews and evangelical and the Christian world, they're all ready to accept this error. So we see it's fundamentally different than the, than the Jewish view. Now from the Catholic view, we see it says for one and two to make an end of, uh, end rebellion and deviation from God's will. 
uh, to make reconciliation is to accept Christ's sacrifice, to bring in everlasting righteousness. This is kind of interesting the way they phrase it, to proclaim an eternal standard of righteousness uh, that surpasses the temporal righteousness under the law. But all this is under the papacy. Mm -hmm. So it's not God's system coming in. It's doing this eternal righteousness standard under papal understandings. So that's because very... confession is involved in there and all sorts of other things. Eucharist is involved in there. Yeah. Uh, the whole nine yards of what it goes with when you're... So because that, I would say that's that's kind of right what it's saying. But then you add the part about under the papacy and it just ruins the whole thing. Yeah. And to seal up the vision and prophecy, that means confirm and conclude all prophecies concerning Christ's advent and to anoint the Holy of Holies, that is sanctify and consecrate Jesus Christ as the ultimate fulfillment of divine promises and prophecy. It's kind of wordy, That's this one. They t I had to get this one from um, one of the their old uh, saints. Uh, I'm trying to remember Aquinas, maybe it was. But they, they were very long-winded in how they put these together, and it's not as perfectly clear as some of the other ones. But it's a wordy way to share the, the Catholic position. Okay, now here's the Adventist view. We kind of lump one and two together in the sense that it's not breaking God's holy law anymore. And to do that, because he, he remembers saying to the Jewish nation, this is not necessarily the people. So he's saying to the Jewish nation, finish the transgression means stop breaking God's law and make an end to this sin, both individually and nationally. Because while we said that individuals can still come to Christ, this particular prophecy was about the nation uh, being God's chosen people. So it's saying to put an end to sins nationally, but what is a nation made up of? Just a bunch of individuals. So you'd have to have both no longer breaking God's law on a national and an individual level, and it would have to be upheld within the very system. And that's yeah. every time like they, they, people came back to God, it was all on his law. It was all coming back to an understanding of the covenant. And so we believe that that's, that's what it means here. Number three and four, we link together to make a reconciliation and bring everlasting righteousness is to accept Jesus Christ as Messiah and accept his righteousness. Number five is to seal up the vision and prophecy is to fulfill all the conditions. I'm surprised none of the other ones got this. To seal up the vision, because we see the words, the vision over and over. To seal up the vision is to fulfill all the conditions in Daniel 9.24. All the other ones went outside of the vision to say that it fulfilled other things when we have to see these are terms of an agreement. So in order to do this, they have to finish the terms of the agreement. So fulfill all the conditions in 924 and understand the prophecies concerning the Messiah's advent, because it's not just the vision of the 2300 days in the 70 weeks. All that is to point to who? Jesus Christ. Christ. So you can't have the a vision sewn up or completed until the advents, uh, the Messiah's advent is understood and accepted. Yeah. And the six is to anoint the Holy of Holies. That is anoint Jesus Christ over King of all under his law of liberty. So essentially anointing Christ as, as head over everything. So in point five, to seal up the vision and prophecy. It says, we have the understanding to fulfill all the conditions contained in Daniel 9, 24 through 27, it should say. Mm -hmm. So that whole prophecy. But we also have to realize that the vision is not just the 70 weeks. As we looked at, it's from chapter 8, too. Mm -hmm. So it's not just fulfilling all the conditions contained in 24 through 27, but it's also the finishing of the 2300-day prophecy. And then to understand the seal up of the prophecy part is to understand the prophecies concerning the Messiah's advent. And then point six actually leads us to what happens at the end of the 2300 days. Mm -hmm. And we see at the end of the 2300 days, which is that's why six comes after five. It says seal up the vision and the prophecy first. So the vision ends. And then what happens? Christ goes into the most holy place. And this is a very Adventist thing that a lot of people are going to give pushback on. And this again plays into what we said about the real sanctuary in heaven. Yes. So this is a very critical concept that people understand. And, and maybe in another video, we can go into this, this heavenly sanctuary and show it where it is in we the Bible. To. Yeah, we're going to have to for sure, because people are going to say, well, how are you making that assumption? But it's not an assumption. Yeah, it is exactly <laughs> what happened at the end of the 2300 days. It's what happened when they sealed up 
when the vision was actually sealed up at the end of the 2300 days, yeah. Christ moved from the holy place, just like the, the earthly sanctuary to holy and most holy. Yeah. Christ moved from the heavenly holy to the heavenly most holy yeah. at the end of the 2300 days. This is, this is what we believe is the correct interpretation. So I'm going to ask you, at the end of 490 years, did the Jewish nation accomplish these things? Well, I guess that would be up for debate, but I do not think so. Yeah, and I think what really happens is when we start putting the math on some of these things, which we're going to do next episode, and we start breaking down, because you're right, we can't conclusively say yes or no, but from the look of things, at the end of 490 years, did the nation of Israel end sinning? No. No. Uh, and we can go through each piece more and more, but that's the simplest way to say, unless sinning stopped, yeah. And the transgression and breaking of God's holy law, not the law of Moses, but the holy law stops. They didn't finish the transgression and they didn't make an end of sin. So now we need to start looking at, we've got a pretty rounded off view of what these, all these views are saying. Now, when did the 70 weeks begin? And this is where things get even more interesting because it says in Daniel 9, 25, why don't you read it for us? So Daniel 9, 25, part one. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to rebuild Jerusalem. Yeah. So this tells us what the starting point is for the 70 weeks. It's going forth of the commandment to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. And, and that's really important. Now, we'll emphasize this in a little bit, but every word there counts. Yep. Because that's going to help us really nail down when that time frame started. Yep. And we have four decrees in history that match this. And here are the corresponding places you can find them in the Bible. But the first decree happened in 538 with mm -hmm. Cyrus, 520 Darius, 457 Artaxerxes makes his first decree. And the same Artaxerxes in 445, even though some evangelicals say 444, it's been changed to 445. And we'll look at that later. Artaxerxes second decree. And you find him in Ezra and Nehemiah. Yeah. So which of these decrees could it be? Now, Judaism says it is none of the four decrees. None of these decrees start the start date for the 70 weeks. And let's look at why. So you've got the four groups here. And there before we had kind of one bubble and all we're looking at, we agree on the 490s, the 70 weeks. Well, now we start to see they're kind of different. And I actually changed them based on their size. The largest of these is Catholicism, evangelical Christianity is second, and then SDA's third and Judaism is fourth. They're actually the smallest of the groups. But you can see in terms of population size, the Catholics and the evangelicals agree it's the fourth decree. Judaism says no decree, and here these Adventists, these pesky Adventists, are saying it's the third decree. And let's try to see if we can discern which one is which. So let's get the nature of the four decrees. So the first one. So Cyrus' decree, which was in 538 BC, and we see that in Ezra 1, 1 to 5, and 2 Chronicles 36, 22 to 23, Cyrus the Great allowed the Jewish exiles to return to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. And that marked the end of the Babylonian captivity. So it's what it says. It says they returned and rebuilt. So that must be the decree, right? But before we jump to conclusions, let's keep looking at the rest here. When we look at the second option, that would be Darius' decree in 520 BC. And remember, BC, we're actually counting forward when the number gets smaller. Yeah, exactly. We're working <laughs> it, it towards goes backwards. zero, not away from. So Ezra 6, 1 to 12, it says that Darius the Great granted permission to finish the temple and dedicated four years later in 516 BC. So what it means is from the first to the second decree, the, the temple in the city actually didn't get finished. Something happened and stopped it in the process. Yeah. So let's look at number three, the third decree option. So we have Arnaxerxes' first decree, and this was in 457 BC, and we find this in Ezra 7, 11 to 28. Arnaxerxes Longiminus, the seventh year of his reign, giving Ezra authority to execute judicial system based on the law of God and to freely teach it in Judah and Jerusalem. Interesting. Okay, so there was a specific decree that was focused like specifically on the law of God as being put back into things. So that's something to keep an eye on. And the fourth one. Artaxerxes' second decree, which was 444 or 
445. And that's in Nehemiah 2, 1 to 8. Same Artaxerxes, 20th year of his reign, allowed for the rebuilding of Jerusalem city walls. Okay, so in this one is the walls. So the first one, you have that the, the Jews can, can do this. The second one's you can finish it. The third one says you can actually enforce the law of God in the full weight of it. And the fourth one says you can rebuild the city walls. And actually, I want to add a little bit of emphasis because the fourth one is almost just like an encouragement of his first decree. Mm -hmm. So the second, the second decree actually took place quite a few years later. In 444, it was Nehemiah who asked permission, hey, can I go to help with the project that's going on here? So this wasn't even necessarily a full-on decree. Hmm. So I would probably disqualify that one because that was more of like an encouragement process because yeah. people were already working on Artaxerxes' first decree. Yeah, and they were based off of that, and this last one was just like a finish it off, reaffirming the finishing it off. Yeah. Okay, so... Let's look and because we, we said which decrees the, the different views said, but let's look at the source material to confirm this. The Catholic view says the specified interval between the 20th year of Artaxerxes, 445, king of the Persians, for it was his cupbearer, Nehemiah, Nehemiah 1 and 2, who, as we read in the book of Ezra, petitioned the king and obtained his request that Jerusalem be rebuilt. So they're taking this fourth decree as like the decree to, to rebuild. Uh, evangelical uh, viewpoint says history was recorded for ancient decrees to restore the temple. So other groups, it's not just us mm -hmm. saying these are the four decrees. Almost all of them agree there's four to choose from, but only one of them fulfills the requirement to rebuild the city as well. A proclamation by Artaxerxes in 445 BC. Again, the Catholics and the evangelicals are together on this. Yeah. So we see that once again. Now, I want to dive into why the Jewish viewpoint rejects all the decrees, because it's actually going to reveal of the four decrees is the real decree by its very reasoning for why it's none of yes. the decrees it's it's interesting stay with us people <laughs> the christian major error in establishing the starting point of daniel's prophecy is caused once again by what mistranslation, mistranslation of the verse specifically the word command or decree mm -hmm. okay since their translation asserts that the starting point of this prophecy is from the issuing of a certain decree to re rebuild jerusalem they incorrectly assume that it is the decree of king artaxerxes specifically referring to the fourth one because yeah. in this whole article he never acknowledges that anyone says the other one so he he is saying looking at the catholic and evangelical world and saying oh the whole christian world thinks it's the fourth one but that's not true however mentioned above there were several different decrees made concerning returning and rebuilding jerusalem so that's the jewish source mm -hmm. and they're acknowledging that. that there was multiple exactly so it continues the same article from the Jewish perspective. Daniel 2, uh, Daniel 9, verse 2. This The word that is used when Daniel says that he wants to understand, quote, the word of the Lord to the prophet Jeremiah. As mentioned above, in all the passages that mention some form or decree or proclamation concerning Jerusalem, none of them use the Hebrew word devar. This is really important. So he's saying of all the four decrees, none of them match the same word. When you look at the concordance, the yep. he Hebrew word used in that 9-2 verse has like a divine meaning to it, not just the weight of, of a man's decree. It says in the last paragraph, therefore, the correct starting point of Daniel's prophecy must be associated with the issuing of a prophetic word, not a human decree. So he's saying none of the human decrees had this devar word. Mm -hmm. Now let's look at what he's saying from the Jewish perspective. Daniel 9, 2 says, wherefore the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, Jeremiah the prophet that he'd accomplished 70 years in the desolation of Jerusalem. In 9, 25, the word commandment is the same word as the word word in verse two. So there, the logic here is because 9, 25 and 9, 2 use the same devar uh, mm -hmm. commandment word or, or divine word that 9, 25 is in relation to the 70 year destruction prophecy of Jer Jeremiah. Yeah. This is the logic. And he's saying because the Devar word is not in any of the other visions or um, decrees that they can't qualify. But he's missing something very important. The starting point of the prophecy that going forth from the word to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, Daniel 25, also begins now listen to this. The begins from the destruction of the first temple. 
So in the next episode, we're going to do the math on this because we already know the Jewish perspective says 490 years. Yep. Now they're telling us that they say the decree that they're looking for is a divine one, not men's decree. And it's the beginning of the destruction of the first temple, which we know is in 586 BC. And we're going to tackle some of that because there's some that say it's a different date. So the word divine word or command equals devar. Human decree. I actually didn't <laughs> finish putting here what the what the word used in the decrees for all the other locations was, but it's different than the word devar. But what he misses was when you go through all the accounts and you just go in your Bible and search for the word devar or go use your concordance and find age 601, whatever mm -hmm. the number is, what you'll find is of the four visions, there is one that has that word connected to it. So let's go look at which one that was. And this is titled why the third decree is correct. Starting in Ezra 7, verse 11, the word devar is used. Let's see how it's used. Now, this is the copy of the letter that the king Artaxerxes gave unto Ezra the priest, the scribe, even a scribe of the devar of the commandments of the Lord and of his statutes to Israel. So the devar here, when we look, the decree that it's talking about is the devar. Mm -hmm. So Artaxerxes gave the human decree to allow the divine decree to be replaced back into the Jewish economy and the Jewish system. Before, imagine rebuilding the simple. Is there any, uh, rebuilding the city? Is there any government that is a government without the ability to enforce law? No, you can't. The, the very definition of a government is the ability to define and enforce mm -hmm. laws. And here, this is the only commandment that has a devar attached to it. And it says uh, from the SDA view, the decree God intends us to use is that of Ezra seven. The only one that has the devar, mm -hmm. the one issued in the seventh year of Artaxerxes, this decree provided for the restoration of local government on a scale not mentioned in other decrees. It was the decree to restore God's law yeah. from the beginning. And the Jewish perspective totally misses this. Now let's finish reading what that, that third decree actually kind of looked like. So here in Ezra 7, 25 and 26, it says, And thou, Ezra, after the wisdom of thy God that is in thine hand, said magistrates and judges, which may judge all the people that are beyond the river, all such as know the laws of thy God, and teach ye them that know them not. And whosoever will not do the law of thy God and the law of the king, let judgment be executed speedily upon him, whether it be unto death or to banishment or to confiscation of goods or to imprisonment. So this is extremely clear. This is God giving the commandments again. Exactly. And every time Jerusalem or every time Israel had to come back to God, what was the main aspect that they had to come back to? God's law. The law. God's law. What was the covenant? God's law. What was the old there covenant? There was a breach in the law. They had to repair the breach in the law. Exactly. And so there's only one of four decrees that has to focus on the local government allowing to teach and enforce the law of God once again, the great devar, the great uh, command. And so when the Jewish perspective was looking at this, they went to all the human decree words and didn't bother using their concordance to yeah. see where the devar was. And you won't see the devar in any of the, any visions ex or any of the, uh, uh, the accounts except for the third decree. I found that fascinating. So now we have start dates for the four, the 70 weeks for all four views. Evangelical and Catholic are the 444 and 445. And we're going to look at why they keep switching back and forth between those dates. We see Judaism is 586 and Adventism is 457. And this concludes... <laughs> Our first walk through Daniel 9, 24 through 27. We're going to continue. I think we've got four questions in to that, those eight to 10 questions that were on initially. And we're in the next couple episodes going to keep chipping away because as we get further and further into it and we start doing the math and we start putting together the pieces of the puzzle, you will see that the weight of evidence brings one answer to the top. And it doesn't matter whether you're Adventist or Jewish or Christian. It's not a denominational view. Yeah. It's the end result of, <laughs> of doing due diligence on these scriptures. And this might seem heavy for those who are new to some of these things. But if you just... Keep studying, keep learning, pray for God's guidance, and go back and watch it again. Yeah. Go through, read through all the quotes and verses again, and take note of, of each of the positions, views, take notes of the verses, each word, because every line upon line, and Revelation says those who remove 
one word or add one word, his name will be removed from the book of life. So we Very have serious. to take in consideration every word. And when we do that and we see the, the grand fulfillment of this whole culmination of this 70 weeks and 2300 days, it's just absolutely amazing. It, it is. And, it, and it, the truth stands for itself. And then you look around and say, well, who's teaching? Who understands this? And you'll find there's only one group. It's not to toot our own Adventist horn. But what we're saying is like when you get to the bottom of it and the truth is what it is and you look up and see who's teaching it, just let it let it be whoever it's going to be. It could be anybody. But more often than not, it's what the we Adventist core teaching has been for a long, long time. And so next episode, we're going to take all this information and really uh, finish off and show people that, you know, there's one that stands above the rest. Yeah. Um, but I hope that it's not too much for people. And I would encourage others, like we're not the only source for this stuff. Go look up the 70 weeks and, and put SDA at the end. Even if you're not SDA, just get better acquainted with it so you can hear it from multiple angles and go listen to the other pastors and leave questions down below. When we read these comments, if they're you know relevant, we'll, we'll bring them on the show and we'll discuss them as a point to say, hey, people are not getting this. We've done mm -hmm. this several times where people in the comments are like, hey, that's not what this is or, or that doesn't make sense. And we'll clear it up in the next episode episode, but we're encouraging everybody, I hope it's clear now, to go to your Bibles, to study yeah. these 70 weeks, even if it's other perspectives, but come back and make sure that everything that you do is as diligently researched before you accept it as, as truth. And we really want to emphasize this isn't about what does Truth Matters say or what does Mackenzie say or Matt say. This is about what does the Bible say? And what is the Bible trying to say when it's saying 70 weeks are determined for thy people and there's 2300 days left of this curse that is put upon this people? And what does that all mean? And this is something that God has said is open to us, right? These prophecies are to be understood. They're a light. And... Uh, we need to be sharing that light. Yeah. So we hope this has been a blessing for our audience. It's been a blessing for us in, in uncovering this. And this is going to become like the Sunday issue, understanding this Antichrist and the seven-year tribulation and the, and the uh, pre-tribulation rapture. All this is tied into what we're talking about. So get really schooled on it because uh, those who believe that stuff are being set up for the final deception in the world. And I want to remind everyone to go to adtv.watch, create a login, go to the resources below so that you can restudy all the verses that you've seen. Matt, could you close with prayer for us? My pleasure. Father in heaven, Lord, we just thank you for your son, Jesus. We just thank you for the opportunity to share the truth with the time we have left. We ask that you be with all the people watching, whether they believe us or not, whether they hate us for what we say or not, we deeply want them to be uh, your children. We deeply want them to know you and live. And for those who do believe us and understand these things, that they might grow in grace, grow in faith, and be a shining example of what a true Christian looks like, one who's quick to forgive and is slow to anger. And Father, we just ask that you would um, bless all those people that they might help us be blessings to others by the fact that they watch and support and share, Lord. We just thank you so much for them, and we thank you so much for the opportunity to serve you in this. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And we'll see you in the next Truth Matters.